Well, hi everyone. My name is Jamie Brandis. I am with the Colorado Small Business Development Center Network's SBDC Tech Source Commercialization Program. I'd like to welcome you all today to Department of Homeland Security Funding Opportunities for Tech Companies. We're happy to be hosting this session in collaboration with the Wyoming SBDC Network. To start, I'd like to introduce you to our state's technology commercialization program, which is designed to support science and technology ventures throughout Colorado. Businesses are pre-startup through advanced second stage, so if you have an innovative technology, you're likely a fit for the program regardless of your stage of business. Different from many accelerators and incubators that lead to equity funding, where you give away an ownership piece of your company, SBDC TechSource focuses especially on sources of non-dilutive capital, where there's no equity given, and on technology commercialization and SBIR or STTR grants. TechSource is specially designed um, as a program that taps subject matter experts to provide you, the science and technology entrepreneurs and companies, from pre-startup through second stage with direct assistance. This comes in the form of customized expert consulting at no cost to you and through relevant workshops, events, and accelerator um, programs in person when possible and throughout the year. Some topics include SBIR, STTR, and advanced industry grant proposals, R&D tax credits, technology commercialization, government accounting, IP protection, market research, market sizing, strategic and tactical planning, access to capital, and much more. These resources are available thanks to support from SBA's FAST program, Visa, the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade, the Minority Business Office, Zero, and the City of Boulder. If you're a business located in a rural part of Colorado or a minority or women owned, we may have additional resources to help you, so please reach out. I would also like to thank our collaborating partner on this webinar, the Wyoming SBDC Network. If you're a Wyoming based business, please reach out and we will get you connected to resources offered through their programs. A few quick things. After this webinar, if you're interested in meeting one on one with an SBDC tech source specialist, or attending events, workshops, or webinars, please visit our website, and it's sbdc-techsource.org to get started. Today's webinar is being recorded, um, and you will receive an email following the presentation with a link to the recording. You'll also receive a copy of today's presentation slides. A few housekeeping things. Everyone is currently on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the chat bar and we'll try to get to them at the end of today's session. We will leave, leave a significant amount of time for Q&A. Um, and right now I would like to introduce today's webinar presenter, Dusty Lang. Um, she's the director of the DHS SBIR program and the LRBAA program manager for the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. Now I will turn it over to her. Uh, thanks for presenting today, Dusty. Thank you. Just a second, I will give you control. While you do that, I will thank everybody for joining and um, reiterate that we're always looking for new folks with whom we can partner at uh, DHS and especially within the S&T Directorate. So hopefully, um, if you've not partnered with us before, today's um, session will be beneficial and informative. Are you able to see my slides? Yep, it looks good. Great, thank you. All right, so I will be joined here by my uh, colleague, Steve Pinkos. Uh, he will be on in a minute. He's gonna be doing some screenshots for us. Um, it's a surprise sneak peek, so stay tuned. So the DHS SBIR program obviously follows the, the rules of the SBIR program across the federal agencies. It's a three-phase program. Phase one is the uh, commercialization, I'm sorry, commercialization, concept feasibility um, portion where a, a new concept that is uh, proposed to one of our topics uh, is able to prove feasibility. For the DHS SBIR program, that is typically done for a five month period of performance at $150,000. Um, and the goal again is, is to be able to show that what your the idea or solution that you propose to the topics that we've um, posted has some feasibility. Now I, sh I should back up and say, 
the DHS SBIR program does do specific topics. Unlike some of the other agencies, we will do topics where we're saying this is what we're looking to solve and we're looking for your innovative solution. We usually do about uh, 10 or so topics a year, 10 to 15 topics a year. At the end of the five month period of performance on the phase one, we will be sending out an invitation for all of the phase one awardees to be able to submit a phase two proposal. The phase two, 17% of those proposals will be selected to go to a phase two. The phase two is where you're going to be developing a prototype to demonstrate the technology that you've proposed. We are typically doing these at a million dollars and for a period of performance of two, two years at this point. Um, and when we're looking at this, we're looking for you to be able to develop that prototype that is actually able to demonstrate the, tech, the capability that you propose. So it's not a full on um, product or, or um, end user um, result. So from there, we are looking for you to be able to take that to a full product or, or end user result. Um, to be able to aid that, we do participate in the TABA program, and I'll be talking about that more later. But in the phase one, that TABA it can exceed the $150,000 threshold of 6500 to 6500 And in the phase two, it is inclusive. So that million dollar threshold would include that $50,000 TABA funding. We also participate in a few other things that are helping to get to commercialization that I will talk about again in a little bit. But I will say that 46% of our phase twos do receive a phase three. So I think that's a, a fantastic um, metric given that we're looking at when, when we're doing innovation, um, obviously that's trying to press that edge of, of technology, trying to do something that's never been done before. So we're looking to really be able to move the needle on, on what the capabilities are. The phase three for SBIR, phase one and two are paid for out of my pot of funding. Um, so I will get 3.2% of any of the extra real funding that DHS gets will come to my office. That's how I, how I fund the phase one and the phase two. And those are kind of on a course to be able to, to proceed. When we get to the end of the phase two, that's where things get even more challenging in that we've got to be able to find somebody who is a customer who wants to take the, the research further and or buy product. Um, it is non-SBIR dollars. Um, there's no limitation, and it can be done via a directed award because the phase one and the phase two are considered the competition. So more about what a directed award means is that when we do phase one and phase two, to be able, eligible for the phase one, you have to be a small business and meet those requirements. Be eligible for a phase two, you know it need to have been a phase one awardee, and then you're competing for the phase two. When you get to phase three, anybody who has received a phase one at any federal agency is able to receive follow-on funding for either research and development, procurement, anything that is that derives from, extends, or completes the efforts under a phase one or phase two. So when you get to that phase three, you can go up to somebody and say, hey, we can do a direct award, meaning no further competition is required. That's a really great part of the program, both for, for you as a, a company, but also for us at the government, because then we can use that and say, okay, we, we've already gotten the competition out of the way. If we see something that we like, we can go ahead and, and further that or, or purchase it. So when we're talking about DHS, I always like to make sure folks understand we are not part of DOD. Um, so we have, we were formed as a result of, or of the instance of 9-11 um, that brought together several agencies that existed into, into one area and then created some, some other ones. So we're looking at protecting the homeland security across the nation, obviously, and that's a, that's a big deal. So what's included in DHS is FEMA. So we do response to disasters, but FEMA also does building and working with community, local communities to, to help them develop resilience so that the impact and the need for emergency um, solutions is decreased. 
We do custom customs and border protection. So we're making sure that, you know, what comes into the country is something that should be coming into the country. Who comes into the country is somebody that we want to be coming into the country. We have the U.S. Coast Guard, which per, um, protects the lighter roll areas around um, the waterways. So anything that is water um, that, that then comes into the U.S. that is protected by the U.S. Coast Guard. They also do rest, search and rescue on water. We have the Transportation Security Administration, which um, most, most folks are familiar with if you've flown. Um, obviously, we're protecting the airlines, but it also has to do with transportation in general. So they also have a broader role in terms of making sure that transportation is safe uh, across the board. Um, so that can include baggage, um, cargo, and those kinds of things. We have immigration and customs enforcement. So that's kind of internal, what happens once folks are, are in within the borders, not the CBP. U.S. Secret Service. Um, so U.S. Secret Service, obviously, most folks know that they're in charge of protecting some of the VIPs within our government. Um, what folks don't always know is that they're also in charge of uh, counterfeit and credit card fraud. And then we have our countering weapons of mass destruction. So this includes um, nuclear radiation detection, as well as some other um, efforts that could be um, um, pursued to try to create, again, mass destruction through, through other means. And we, it says first responders, we, the first responders don't belong to us. Obviously, those are part of your local communities and um, they, they, you know, um, are acting and, and producing their, their work on behalf of your communities. Um, but we do have technology development to support first responders. Um, many of you will, will know that your first responder um, organizations don't have a lot of funds um, to begin with and to try to do research and technology um, to, to try to develop things to, to be able to perform their job better um, would be incredibly challenging. So that's something that we pick up at DHS to try to, to, try to support. And I always recommend that if you're looking at doing something with DHS um, and you're not familiar with DHS submission, obviously do research. But one of the one of the ways to start is you can Google a day in the life of DHS and it will give you a, a longer list of kind of all of the things that DHS does, as well as the magnitude of what's done. Um, when you look and you see the, the board, number of border um, miles that we need to protect, the number of search and rescues that, that the Coast Guard does in a day is just, it's amazing. So understanding the magnitude of the efforts that have to be carried out is, is generally really important to understanding what kind of technologies would or would not be able to be feasible in the operational environment. So I went over the you know three phases for DHS. Every um, federal agency has their own calendar of how they how they carry that out. So here is a, a typical calendar. Obviously, this could change in the future. Anything that we're doing, we're always looking at making sure the process is as up to date as it can be and is as effective as it can be. So always keep you know looking at the solicitations when they come out, reading the solicitations. We generally try to call out if there's changes from the last one to this one, but um, please be sure to read everything and, and stay tuned. Um, but generally, um, we're going to be sending out our new solicitations for soliciting uh, phase ones around, the pre-solicitation will come out around mid-November typically. The solicitation release when you can submit to the solicitation usually comes out mid-December and then that will close around mid-January. I always recommend folks check it out when we do the pre-release, the pre-solicitation release because that's when you can ask those questions directly to the topic manager. And even if you have to ask those questions a little into the solicitation, that's fine. We have a short period, um, but those questions will get released as part of the an amendment to the solicitation rather than having those, those back and forths with the, the topic manager. Um, but it also just gives you less time to be able to maybe do a, a, an accommodation to something that may need to be mitigated. The phase two are typically due from the phase one awardees in the October to, to uh, November timeframe. And then um, the awards happen within 120 days, um, almost always, especially for the phase ones from the solicitation close.
Um, we are, we have also um, undertaken a new uh, idea for how we can reach out to industry for SBIR, and that's our OATS RFI process. So OATS at DHS stands for Other Agency Technology Solutions. Um, and that's something we've been doing for, for many, many years, is we've been looking at how do we leverage technologies that were initiated at another federal agency for DHS mission needs. As I mentioned at the beginning, any federal agent, any, any SBIR that's been started at any federal agency can be leveraged by another federal agency. Whether those SBIR funds can be applied or not is a little bit um, more um, tricky, um, but we usually are able to, to figure out some ways on, on ones that need further development. Um, and that's what we're looking for under the OATS RFIs is we submitted, um, we posted three RFIs in July, um, looking for technologies that maybe that were initiated at other federal SBIR agencies or STTR agencies that may be able to be tweaked, modified, further developed for use at DHS. So we're looking through the responses now. Um, and so far it looks like there's um, several, several promising uh, technologies that we'd like to learn more about. And we plan on, plan on trying to do this again in the future so that we can, being one of the smaller agencies, leverage maybe some of those larger agencies' invested dollars. So I promised I would talk about some other things that we do under the SBR program. Um, we do par um, partner with NSF and offer the i program to, um, we have a limited number, but we offer it to our phase one awardees. Um, at the end of their phase one. And the i program is designed to help small businesses understand how to get to their customer needs. So it involves going out and talking to um, potential customers, not about the product that you're developing, but about what their needs are. So NSF has a great program. It's it's a common, it got a, a lot of recognition. Um, we're happy to be able to partner with them to, to allow folks to participate in that. We also have our commercialization readiness pilot program where we can take some of our phase twos and after the end of the original phase two, try to do uh, some additional funding that can get this further down the TRL path and potentially make it a better, um, more attractive thing to an end user who needs to know what is this product gonna look like really when I'm ready to use it. So we, we will do a several of those per year. And then we also have the commercialization assistance marketplace program. So this is provided as a way for us to, we have a, a company under contract that is able to provide some commercialization assistance, meaning they can do um, some market research reports, they can help develop commercialization um, program or, or um, strategies and those types of things, and also helps get um, some information about who the end users are, who the customers may be that you could reach out to and engage. That is not included in the TABA. So many agencies will offer some commercialization assistance and often um, if they do, it may or may not be something where you're not able to then um, propose TABA under your under your um, your phase one or phase two contract. We these, these, this is funded separately, so it's not part of TABA. And then um, I talked about the, the OS program. So typically the way we've done it in the past is that we um, either search for or um, become aware of a SBR that's been initiated at another agency and then we pursue that. The idea of the new approach doesn't negate the fact that we can, we, we can go forward um, if we hear about it. Um, it just gives us another opportunity to let small businesses do what they do best and be innovative and tell us how they may be able to, to you know, twist or, or, or leverage their technology that they've already got in development. And then uh, we have a deconstructing SBIR series, webinar series. So um, we do several of these per year, try to, to touch on subjects that would be of interest to small businesses that may be wanting to participate in small business program. Um, and I will do one typically every year during the pre-solicitation. So it's always a good way to hear about the upcoming solicitation, find out about some of the, uh, the new things that we may have undertaken um, and be aware of, of any of the additional resources. So I definitely recommend checking that out. You know, as you can see, we have um, those available um, on our, our YouTube page. So feel free to check out any of the uh, previous 
episodes. And uh, you can also uh, check out new ones coming up. I'm gonna turn over the audio here to, to Steve and then Steve, I'll be um, still clicking through. So you'll have to um, let me know when to, to advance the next slide. But I have one slide in between this, but we're gonna give you a, this is our website, the DHS um, S&T website, where you can go and find out more information about the program. Um, and just generally, you know, if, if this will show the, um, the deconstructing as well, as well as if there's one coming up, any changes to the program. Um, here's some resources to check out to make sure you know how to get to this. And um, as Jamie indicated that we're going to be um, providing these slides, so don't worry about furiously writing down these URLs. Um, as promised, so we are gonna be deploying a new portal at DHS, the one we've had is, is um, great, but it's time for some modernization. So we're, we're working on that literally as we speak, my team is, is working on getting the new one rolled out. We're hoping for that to be able to be deployed at the beginning of next week. So we thought we'd give you a sneak peek um, and some slides of some screenshots. So Steve, did you wanna pick uh, up and- Sure, I'll just say. Yeah, I'll just stay on, on audio here to, so that we can keep this moving. But as you can see on screen, um, for those of you that may or may not have seen our portal in the past, um, there was a, a, a kind of split between what the SBIR portal and the uh, broad agency announcement portal was, two different separate uh, URLs. So what you see here is that we've kind of created a new landing page uh, for both basically both portals in general. The, the new web address will be OIP dhs.gov to where you'll be able to select from four different programs out there to be able to get to the landing page to see more information, SBIR being one of them, and uh, Long Range Broad Agency Announcement is another program Dusty manages uh, from that card. Go ahead and the next one. Uh, so what you can now see, so what, once you click one of the cards, it'll take you to a landing page, as you can, you know, right, as Dusty mentioned, excuse me, Earlier, you know, we don't have any open solicitations at the time, um, so it's a good place to at least get uh, get some more information about the program, what's going, you know, what's going on, what's upcoming. Um, up in the top menu, there's a there's a solicitation option, very similar to how the existing portal works today. Um, but it, uh, the thing I want to call out also is that you'll have to create a new profile login to be able to create a, a company account to submit any proposals once the solicitation is open. So, but it's kind of a new, little bit new look and feel, uh, hopefully reorganizing the information in a better way on screen for you. Next slide. Um, so once you log in, um, what you will actually have access to because it's one, uh, as I kind of mentioned, one portal for any proposals, regardless of pro uh, program that you've submitted to in the past, um, you'll actually see, you know, proposal tabs for each of the different programs and be able to navigate that dashboard in one location, um, be able to view, view any proposals you have already started or submitted, any kind of status in that regard, and also if you've uh, also received any awards. Um, it's kind of a hopefully a one-stop shop dashboard here that you can log into to see status throughout many of them. So, yeah, go ahead, next slide. Um, a couple of things that we also have noticed when you know we've uh, gotten uh, SBIR uh, solicitations in the past, we wanted to call out a couple of different uh, things that um, it make it very not, you know, easily not responsive to the solicitation when it, once it comes out, um, is to really read the solicitation and make sure you're noting what's the duration for a phase one, what's the duration for a phase two. Um, the initial one will be a phase one and kind of just a screenshot of how that uh, the submission screen will look. I'm also trying to highlight there that, you know, we're, make sure that that duration field is filled out with the, the appropriate duration. So if the solicitation calls for five months, don't enter six months or 10 months in that, in that duration when you're going to submit because the maximum allowed per the announcement is five months. So definitely watch for, for that key field when you're going through these screens. Uh, we really want to make sure the period performance is, is within the time, timeline allowed by the solicitation. Next slide. And then also another uh, big thing, I guess you could say, and, and TABA does play into this a little bit, Dusty was mentioning that earlier, 
um, but there's a there's a threshold uh, for phase ones of the 150,000, um, and then phase twos uh, is is a little bit different in the in the in the threshold. So please, when you're filling out the the cost proposal form, be be cognizant of the total proposal cost line. Um, we'll get many proposals come in that are above the 150,000 threshold, and don't say that they're also requesting or looking for the the TABA assistance that Dusty will mention later. So um, that is something that will become non-responsive to the to the solicitation. So please monitor the the total proposal cost that we're you're not a, going over the threshold allowed by the solicitation. Next slide. And then finally, I think this is the last one from sneak peek perspective. Um, the the solicitation will also call for you know what you can upload as so either as required or optional supporting uh, materials along with all the different forms and fields on the tabs that you see in the green. Um, so be very cognizant of the the page limits that are that are noted next to that. Um, when we're looking for a technical proposal in the last solicitation for SBR, for example, it's at a 25 page you know limit, and that would include you know you know any anything from point a to point b is how i'd like to say it so you know if we get something that's 30 pages i mean that that, that is easily not meeting as i said the the compliance of the solicitation so watch for you know, i was trying to highlight where that area would be pending the uh the different material that uh, may or may not be optional or required you know what to what to where to, the portal will assist you uh other than going back into the announcement itself which will, which is your source which is your you know the true where where to look for any page requirements, but we try to highlight it here on the portal as well. You know this one is we're looking for a certain number of page max. So just some a few things um, we wanted to call out that we see as you know, um, non-responsive to our phase ones, but also kind of use those that that to give give you a sense of what the screens look like that's coming. Um, it's definitely a different look and feel than the port, existing portal today. I think that was the last one, Dusty. Right. Thank you, Thanks. Steve, very much. Um, so, the, as Steve mentioned, um, we have um, several portals that have been uh, kind of merged into one central landing page um, and, and access. So, what we're doing is um, one of the programs is the LRBAA program that I'm going to chat with you about today. So the LRBAA is a, it's a BAA, a broad agency announcement. Broad agency announcements are something that are, are done under, it's a different part of the FAR than, than the normal contracting process that, that we would use. Um, the BAAs are not dissimilar than to, to the SBIR in that they're typically soliciting novel ideas. Um, so they're putting out the, hey, this is what we're trying to solve, this is what we're trying to do, how would you, um, give a solution or, or propose a technology. Um, the, the long range BAA is a little bit different than most BAAs in that it's open for five years um, and it's continually in the state of being able to receive new submissions. Um, so I will talk ab about that more in a little bit, but there's no specific due date for your initial submission. Um, to the right page okay um so the the way the process works is there's kind of three steps the the first step is you see a topic you think you might have an idea um so these topics are very very high level very broad in order to lower the lift um for both industry and and dhs we have a, an initial step called industry engagement where you submit a three-page white paper and a quad chart and a video if, you're, if your technology is far enough along for that, that kind of gives an overview of what you're proposing. And then we, from that point, recommend or don't recommend if you're going forward to the virtual pitch. So if it's something we're interested in, we'll say, hey, yep, please proceed to the next step, virtual pitch. And at the virtual pitch, you'll have an opportunity to take 12 page or 12 slide presentation, and you'll have 20 minutes to present in, in more detail and talk about the technology or solution that you're proposing. The government can take a, a little intermission and then come back and provide some questions to you to get a better idea of some of the things they may think um, weren't quite clear or things that may be integral to it that, that may not have been addressed. 
Um, they cannot at any point in this tell you, hey, do this instead or take this path or here's a better idea. But if you're if you get to the virtual pitch dates, pay attention to those questions. Those questions are often, again, things that that maybe weren't something that you were you realized would be um, needed to be considered um, and can be valuable for you in if you're recommended to go to the third step, which is the written proposal. Knowing that um, writing a proposal is, is a, a, a pretty good undertaking in terms of labor and costs and all those other things, um, we want to make sure that, that when we get to this stage, there's a, a better chance that we are thinking we're going to be able to go forward with it. So in the first step, you'll be um, asked for a rough order of magnitude on, on the costs. Make sure you're doing a reasonable and, and really what you believe that to be. Um, if you if it's something that's that's a large amount of money, um, it may be something outside of the scope of either whether the funding that we have and or it could be something that it, we, we may have that much funding, but we have to address multiple needs with that. So you don't want to be dis dismissed at the beginning because it's just not feasible in terms of the funding that would be required. At the same time, you don't want to say, oh, it's only going to cost this much, get all the way to the written proposal where you're going to be saying this is what we're, the contract would be set up for and find out, well, you went through all this and, and now the costs are actually going to be higher and now it's, it's not feasible. We, we wouldn't be able to do it for that. So really give some thought to this at the beginning of the stages, but when you get the written proposal, this is what we will be using as the basis for a potential contract award. So from this stage, then we're looking at, is this something that we want to try to proceed to pursue an award? Um, and there's timelines and goals throughout this that we really try to meet, um, but understanding that, that folks have a lot going on within the industry or within with industry and, and with us, we we are um, it's these are goal timeframes that we're presenting here. So what can an LRBAA topic do? So again, we're, these are going to be very, very broad, very high level. They're meant to kind of demonstrate or, or discuss what areas of of um, technology we're looking for, what kind of areas we want some solutions in, um, but leaving it broad enough to, to allow industry to really be able to come forward and say, I have this idea and I think that there's this is a way that, that DHS can benefit from this way to approach one of your challenges. Um, but they aren't for they aren't for support. So if, if it's a, hey, I could I could help you guys by supporting you by carrying out this type of tasking. That's not what it's for. It's not for um, creating a resource, research consortia or, or evaluating another technology or program that's out there. We're really looking for under the LRBAA, a, hey, I have this idea on a technology or, or, or a, a, something to develop and pursue. I know, what I how I would do that, and I'm here to tell you. Here's here's my idea. Is that something that is of interest to you? So just make sure that you're aligning it. Like I said, the topics are broad, but make sure it still falls within that. Sometimes I'll get calls from from folks saying my technology doesn't fall under any of the topics. That's that's possible. We are not if we don't have a, a need in an area, and or we don't have funding. To, to put forward in an area, we're not going to have a topic out there for that because that would that wouldn't be a, the best use of, of the time of folks within industry or or internally. Um, so make sure that it falls within the parameters of the topic and is something that addresses the the need that's called out um, and that it's something that that you know how you're going to pursue. Um, here's some resources. Before I, I go forward, though, I, I apologize. I must have flipped it out of the slides as I was trying to get them ready real quick. Um, this The LRBAA is very broadly open. So it is open to academia, FFRDCs, um, you know, small business, large business, international. It's it's a very broad one. So if you are looking for some, some way to try to um, be able to get your idea to somebody to look at, um, I recommend, you know, the LRBAA is a place to start. Again, though, don't don't just submit it's if 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 it comes in under a topic that is not it's a, for which it's not applicable we won't be able to award it it is still a competitive process so here's some of the the resources um, to be able to um, get to uh, for the LRBAA it has our internal site the portal site that's at 
not only help his own legacy, um, the solicitation and all those types of things, and you will be getting this information out. Um, the other thing I wanted to be able to provide to folks is our um, contact information. So um, we have folks, one of whom is, is Steve that you heard from, that are always looking at the, um, the emails. We have a, a general email at, um, box for both SBIR and for LRBAA, and that is monitored um, continually during, during office hours. Um, we also have um, phone numbers if you are having trouble kind of putting it into words to type it out, then you can contact us and, and leave us some information via a phone uh, phone call. And then you can join our mailing list. Um, as I, we have a, the deconstructing SBIR, whenever we're gonna put one of those on, we'll make sure folks are aware of it. We'll make sure folks are aware of the solicitation. Same thing, we have an LRBAA Today webinar where we um, have folks that are um, part of the um, programs for which we're, we have these other VA topics come out and talk about the programs. Um, I, I probably is available in one of those, um, but if not, I'll make sure we get that link included. Um, so you can see past our BAA today. So, so because these are broad topics and intended to be long term, um, generally those are, are are something that have have life. And we just finished up season two, so those are all out, out there. We also have um, webinars on the SBIR process and the LRBA process that we can provide links to that weren't in here, but we'll make sure we get those as well. Um, but the bottom at the bottom is the mailing list, and we send out emails. We we don't send out junk. We send out stuff of you know, hey, this solicitation's coming up. We have a an, a webinar coming up um, that you may want to be aware of. Those types of things. So we're we send out maybe one or two per month um, when we have something going on. So I highly recommend signing up for the mailing lists. And I think that's everything. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Jamie, for hopefully some Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Dusty. Um, this is really helpful. And I will do a plug for their newsletters. I find them very helpful each month, too, <laughs> to know what's going on. Yes. Um, okay, so we do have questions coming in. Um, so one person is asking um, if they have, or for the DHS phase three, could they use their DOD phase two uh, as part of that? Absolutely. Um, I, I have, um, I actually, I worked with our, um, the, the policy folks in the DHS procurement um, office recently, and um, I was really happy to be able to develop with them um, a job aid for D the DHS contract community, all of the contract community, um, because what would happen is, is when companies would talk to folks with throughout DHS um, and or, you know, vice versa, we would, they would learn about something they wanted to try to pursue, and the companies are usually aware that this can be done and would say, hey, well, you, you can do a phase three and it can be based off of this. And I was able to do this job aid that, because often then they're like telling the contracting officer, go talk to, to Dusty, she can tell you this. And I'm like, yeah, but them just saying, hey, some lady over in s &T told me I can do this. So it was great to be able to work with them. The job aid talks about what the authorities are and what the rules are for the phase three so that they know, hey, their their policy folks are, are saying, hey, contact the SBIR office. We worked in co coordination with them. We also developed a memo that they can complete rather than the JNA that will make it a little bit easier for that package to be able to go forward. So Yes, if uh, you get somewhere and you're talking to somebody at DHS and, and they are not, the contracting was not, officers not familiar with it, and I totally get their, you know, they're wanting to make sure they're following the rules and this is a little bit more tricky to find than some other things, make sure you contact my office and we'll, we'll make those connections for you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so this person is asking about um, CDP and ICE. Um, they've heard that, um, you know, they might be shutting down. Um, so they're wondering how feasible it would be to, you know, apply under some of these things that, you know, there's, um, you know, potential for some of them being shut down. So um, I'm assuming that they're talking about the government-wide potential shutdown. Um, <laughs> So that's not, so what happens um, if there's a government shutdown is essential 
services and, and, and folks will still be working. So um, you guys might remember from the shutdown in 2018, was that long ago? Um, you know, obviously TSA agents were still working. Um, uh, CBP folks were still working. Um, the government has to make determinations on what, what items are essential services and have those folks still work. The unfortunate part for them is that they're not going to get paid during that time. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that that something happens and we're able to, to get that um, taken care of because the TSA agents that were working last time and then some of those other folks. Um, but SBIR, as I'm, I'm sure you're probably thinking, is not a considered an, an immediately essential um, effort. So what would happen is we wouldn't, if we, during the last, during one of the shutdowns, there was a, a, um, a solicitation open. And when we came back, we did a small extension to make sure that we could wrap it up. If something's out there, um, it'll be st still be open. If something is scheduled to, scheduled to go out and it's not out, it won't. As a government employee, we are not, unless we're part of those essential folks that have been deemed you will go to work, we are not allowed to do any work while we're furloughed. So yes, that would that would shut some stuff down. Understood. Okay, so there's been a few questions about if people are identifying gaps that they'd like to bring to attention um, as you know potential topics that you just might want to consider coming out with. Is there a way to do that to influence any of the SBIR or LRBAA um, announcements that might be coming out? So the LRBAA, um, not really, because those those are broader. So if there's something you're thinking of that is that has some applicability, then certainly um, you know I would look for those topics. They're broad enough that that if it's not something that they're either looking to pursue or or, or um, they may be finding other ways to to address it, um, then it's, you know not something that's that's going to be added because we're not we don't do specific specific technologies gaps or whatever under the LRPA, they're, they're larger. Um, under the SBIR, you can, there is a way for you to submit a topic idea. Um, I, despite <laughs> the caveats and the, the you know heads up that I give folks, um, every year we get lots and lots that we cannot forward. So we're not looking for you to submit an idea, this is my technology idea. Um, that's not going to go to anybody because this is not a way for you to get your technology solution in front of somebody. It's a way for you to present, hey, have you thought about doing an SBR topic on this? So it has to be submitted in the form of a topic. It's almost like the Jeopardy. It must be submitted in the form of a topic. Not So not the answer, it's the question. So um, it has to have those elements. If we get ones that have the elements submitted in, in the proper context and all those things, we will forward it with our topic call to see if anybody has interest in that. Because what we need to do is have somebody internally champion that topic because somebody has to be to say yes we will make sure we we engage with the right folks to get these requirements addressed you know and, and that this is asking for something that would actually be operationally feasible the other caveat that i give is that when we get that topic in it's going to come back out in a way that makes sense for dhs so it may not come back out in the same format, it, it likely won't come back out in the same format that it came in. And it may not come back out in the format that even has your idea as a potential solution. So just be aware, it's gonna be reworked to make sure that it's fitting our needs and that the operational folks are engaged. So, it's, but but yes, please submit ideas, just, you know, heed these, heed these uh, advices. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay, so this person has, or they're going for an STTR, I think. So they're wondering um, if they have a university partner for the phase one and phase two, is it required to also work with that um, university partner for a phase three? So DHS um, used to have an STTR program when, when we were first formed and stood up. We no longer have an STTR program. We, we are under that threshold. Um, so I can answer this two ways. One, it's not required for the phase one or phase two because we have no STTR program, so there's no requirement for the university. Having worked STTR for um, the Navy for many, 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 many years, I can tell you <laughs> that it is not required for the for the phase three. Many of the things for phase three are, are not necessarily um, requirements. And part of that is 
it's not SBI or STTR funding. So many of these requirements are what is required for you to receive SBI or STTR funding. So you no longer have to be a small business. Um, you know, as many of these things no longer apply once you get to phase three. Got it. Um, so this person was saying that they didn't see any opportunities with FEMA this round. Is that something that would be coming out um, or I guess Maybe you can talk a little bit about the schedule of solicitations and kind of how that works too. I think you covered it before, but reiterate. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes what looks like it's not a FEMA opportunity could, could in fact be for FEMA. Um, and so I'll talk about it that two ways as well. One, FEMA, it's, it's, it's often misunderstood if that we're looking for something for community resilience, that, that FEMA may be the end user and may purchase it. Um, as I kind of mentioned when I was talking about FEMA, a lot of times we're looking for local communities to be able to build their resilience as best as they can. Um, so we will do topics that actually kind of are for FEMA not to be needed. <laughs> it's like the goal is let's not have to send FEMA in. Um, so we will do topics that may not seem like they're for FEMA because it, again, the goal is, is for these communities, but also with a FEMA topic, be, be, be aware there's not this like place in the middle of the United States where they house all the things they need for, for all of the um, potential emergencies. We, as, as you may have um, seen recently, you know, it's, sometimes things happen and, and there's either an emergency we didn't kind of think we would need to respond to or it, it manifests in a way that we there's a new challenge. So often FEMA is relying on partners with whom they've, they've got um, relationships or worked with, or again, the communities, I mean, what resources are they aware of? Because the best idea for FEMA is that there's something nearby to be able to deploy. Um, so, so that's one of the ways it may not seem like it's FEMA. The other is that there may not be a FEMA topic. So we have one of the smaller, um, you know, SBIR budgets across federal agencies. So again, having worked at, we're, you know, for the Navy before, there was a wide range of topics every solicitation. Um, we don't have that same ability to, to do a, a topic. And we don't say we're going to do one FEMA, one CBP, one, you know, ICE, one of each. We, we do what comes in and makes sense for SBIR and is prioritized. So it may or may not have a FEMA topic in it. That makes sense. Um, so then there's also a question about wildfires, um, since this is becoming a bigger threat. Um, is that something that falls under any of these categories yet, or is it something you see potentially coming out as a topic? We actually, what's, what's interesting is um, we had a flood sensor topic um, several years ago. Um, and this is one of those things that if you develop a technology and it's applicable, you know, from a, it's from another agency or, or whatever, you can apply it to other scenarios. So there's actually flood sensor topics that were developed under SBIR several years ago that um, we've been looking at how they could be potential, used potentially for um, for fires. Um, I the SBIR topics right now, we're we're in the midst of of selecting which ones are, are going to go forward. Even if I knew which ones they were, I wouldn't be able to say which ones they were because we released them to to be fair and equitable all at the same time to everybody. Um, I but I I can also say that you know we've got a lot going on right now and I can't think of whether there is one in there or not. So I couldn't say even if there was. Um, but it's certainly not something we we are always looking to be able to provide the resources um, for the DHS community. This is actually, you know, but, but if we're developing something today under phase one, that's gonna take a couple years to get out and be, to be deployed. So sometimes we'll do things instead like an OATS or, you know, look at the flood sensors and see how we can, we can use those for um, the more immediate needs. Great. Okay, so this person is asking about um, research consortia um, as far as the um, LRBAAs. Um, so if they are a small business partnered with the university to research their technology, can they apply? There is a difference between a research consortia and a partner. 
So if you are partnering with the university, there's nothing that precludes you from partnering with the, with the university under the LRBA. So if that's, if that's what you're um, looking to do, yes. The research consortia has other elements and, um, you know, basically what we're doing is making sure that each person coming into the partnership is bringing an element that is required for the development of it and that those those elements are defined and we know what each is bringing and this is not a, you know, hey, we're just bequeathing some funding to you guys and getting some stuff done. Got it. Okay, so this question is about the new portal. Um, they're wondering if the company profiles will be automatically transferred or if there's going to be a step for them to take. Yes, and when you think automatically, it sounds so simple. I'm telling you, yes. So, so absolutely. So the what's it's a great question, and more details are going to be sent out to folks um, once we're ready to hit that button. Um, but every all the information is coming over with the exception of your password and this is for security purposes your password is going to need to be reset so to get in you're going to get an email you're going to get instructions on how to make that happen um, all of your information should be um, in there we've been doing testing and and digging and are currently digging now just to make sure we're trying to dot every t and cross every i um so that so that uh we can have all that information come over so yeah you should be able to access all the all the things that you had in there previously great thank you okay so this is a question about artificial intelligence um so they're wondering what is dhs's guidance um, on solutions that involve ai um since they know there's questions about security and privacy um, that could be linked so are some of those things funded or is it something that's you know hot button we yeah we had a topic last round um for machine learning ai um we do we are it's definitely an area of interest um one of the deconstructing sbirs that i did last year as a matter of fact was on privacy um so there is there is a concern um that we're proceeding with efforts that are that are able to comply with you know what the the rules and the laws and the you know the practices that make sense so you know we're not we're not trying to um do anything that um would be invasive and and, and um, illegal for privacy concerns or any of those types of things everything that we do goes through a review for if it's meeting privacy um elements um, in fact, even the portal that we just did um, had a, a, you know, an extensive review of how are we, what information we're collecting, how are we using it, that kind of thing. So everything we're doing is is doing that. Um, it's important for for companies to realize that um, because it's, I'm, you know, kudos to the person that asked the question. Sometimes this comes from, you know, a place of, of concern. But it's also even if even if you're like, okay, well, you know, I don't have concerns about privacy. Well. We do. So if you're proposing something, um, it's it's something to be aware of that it, if it's not abiding by the privacy rules that we need to abide by, then it's not something we'd be able to pursue. Great, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> okay, the next one just asks if there is um, the opportunity to direct to phase two with EHS. We do not have that authority. Um, so there's um, in the policy directive and in the legislation, there are, are agencies that are given direct phase two authority. Um, I, I, I haven't been tracking all of them and whether they're all exercising that authority, even the ones that, that have. I know that um, when you're trying to go direct to phase two, it, it sounds like great. Why don't, why don't we skip phase one? And and um, for the same reason, I tell tell folks that. Uh, that I work with internally, they'll come up and go, well, why don't we just do the phase twos for only a year? I don't know. <laughs> it's like, yes, we'll just pay them the same amount of money and expect the same results in, in a shorter time frame, right? No, that's that's you know not how it works. So if we um are are given the authority, it's still something that I will want to 
pursue in a in a thoughtful way and make sure that we're looking at topics that we're able to establish there is a a good um body of of proof of feasibility that would be able to be leveraged to be able to go to that phase two because i don't want us just jumping into it and not having the, the phase one is is fantastic especially at dhs having a smaller pot of money um, it gives us the opportunity to look at we do on average three phase ones per topic we can't do that for phase two um, so this allows us to put some money towards some ideas that we may have to pass on if, if we didn't have a phase one um, and really kind of see is this okay let's let's give this one a shot let's see how this pans out it's interesting and, and you know it may be a long shot but you know if it is this would be fantastic so so there's benefits to not jumping immediately to phase two um that i would want to make sure that we're not kind of skipping out on something that, that um we would benefit from and that the, the, the industry would benefit from great thank you Okay, so um, this person has an existing DOD phase two. Um, so they're wondering if it's appropriate to apply for the LRBAA for follow on funding, or if you think there's a more appropriate path. Um, if there's an LRBAA topic, I certainly would say yes, don't don't pass up an opportunity, right? Um, so yes, pursue that. Um, I would recommend that they um, note that it's an SBIR technology. Um, it's, it's not required. They don't have to. Um, I recommend it because often then what we can do is make sure that um, we're set up so when the contract is awarded, um, it will, you know, the contract, like, like I discussed before, the contracting officer would know that this is an SBIR contract. We can help them make sure that the um, SBIR data rights clauses is, is included so they know this is, you know, how it works and they can consult with us. They can talk to their to their folks, their leadership. It, it you know, again, if, if you don't put it, all that stuff is going to happen. It just may happen easier if you make sure they are aware of it. Great. Thank you. Okay, so this person is saying they just got past the industry engagement step. They're wondering if you can expand a bit more on what's expected to the pitch phase. So um, it's it's 12 slides. What I recommend is this is um, you have an opportunity that a lot of people don't have. You know, you've gotten the opportunity to pitch an idea to the government. Um, and I, I think thoughtfully, um, if that's maybe redundant, about how you're going to be able to help DHS. A lot of times folks come in and they have this idea and it's like, this can do this. And it, it there's great things that may be able to be developed in furthering science, but if we're gonna invest in it, um, we need to make sure that we actually know who at DHS would benefit from it and how. And, and I'd recommend understanding what that, how, that, how that current scenario is addressed um, so that you can say, one, that this, this is how your idea would fit in and how it's better than the current way we're addressing it. Um, and, and be able to, to articulate that. Those are, are my recommendations. If you, if, if, if you don't know that, try to do some research in that area. And I know it's, I know it's hard. Um, it's not something that we have, you know, we just, it's, I, I want to, I would love to set people up and say, okay, we'll get somebody to talk to you about that. It's just, you know, there's, there's lots going on. Um, and people have are, are doing a lot to try to make uh, Homeland safe. And so sometimes we don't have that opportunity to do it with everybody that's out there. So but we do what we can. <laughs> Great, thank you. And there are a few questions we didn't get to that were more specific. Um, so happy to follow up or, you know, with people who didn't <laughs> get their questions answered. Um, but Dusty, um, as far as just kind of the last question, could you go over again, um, you know, when the next solicitation will be coming out and kind of what people should look for? Maybe even, you know, if they have questions, are they able to talk to topic authors? And is there a window of time for that? Just kind of timing stuff. Yep. 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 
So um, mid-November is typically when the pre-solicitation comes out. We're really working to try to, we, by, by legislating my law, we have to do 15 days. I really like to try to make it 30. So again, hopefully we'll have it out mid-November. Um, and definitely recommend jumping in there and seeing. One of the things we've done recently is we used to do a posting of just the topics for the pre-solicitation. Um, last year, I moved to let's let's send a draft of the solicitation out with that as well. So not only will you get the topics, but you'll also be have more time to be able to read over some things and and potentially understand is there an area that I that I have questions on. So don't just think about it. Certainly think about it in terms of the topics. But don't just think about it in terms of the topics. Think about, do I understand what's being um, uh, requested here? And stuff Steve talked about, those aren't the only things. Those are just, hey, this, this is the, the big ones, right? Um, but, but there's other things that can make you um, be deemed unresponsive to, to the solicitation and, and any work that you put into a proposal not be able to be even evaluated. Um, but so yes, at that point, review everything. If it's a question about the topic, um, you can't call or, or you can't call anyway. You can't email and ask, hey, would this be a great idea? That's a business decision you have to make. You can ask clarifying questions. Hey, I noticed that you, you know, have this in there, but there's one parameter that for which you don't have is 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 size, you know, is the length of, of the device important. Um, you can certainly ask that. Anything that, that you ask in that pre-solicitation will be back and forth between you, unless we realize, oh yeah, we should have told somebody. And we should have told everybody, hey, don't make it, you know, longer than three feet. So if we need to, we'll we'll use that information and put it in there. But if it's something that could potentially divulge or or kind of lead to or give more away than you'd like to, definitely make sure you're doing that in that pre-solicitation. Um, all of that is a time you can ask questions about those topic clarifications. The very beginning of the solicitation, you can send in emails, but then we collect all those, we collect all the answers, and all of those are posted as an amendment to the solicitation on SAM.gov, and everybody sees the questions and answers. At any time, you can ask us questions, and that's to my office, about the solicitation and if there's anything that needs to be clarified. And we would love for you to do that in the pre-solicitation as well, in case it's not clear. I mean, I mean we go through this stuff you know, over and over and over, and then somebody asks questions like, yeah, I can see how you can interpret that way. So we'd rather have a chance to clarify for that for everybody, and we'd rather you not ask at the last minute and, and be in a, a flurry or a fluster to, to get it submitted properly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dusty. I know we're up on time, um, but like I said, we will send out the materials um, when we can. <laughs> so we'll get those out to everyone. Um, thank you again, Dusty. Any closing thoughts you want to leave people? We're definitely looking to broaden the, the, the folks with whom we're able to partner. Um, so yes, please, please sign up for our mailing list and uh, give, a, give a look over to the LRBAA and the upcoming SBR solicitation. Happy to be able to work with new folks. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Have a good day. Me too.